You'll remember that we are in our Lenten series where we are following Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And this time of Lent is a time of introspection and um, deepening of prayer life to kind of face the things that stand between us and a life lived fully with God. And this lesson this morning is particularly helpful for that. In the middle of this sermon, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. And he has uh, maybe some counterintuitive, counterintuitive advice to just go in your room and shut the door. And that might be the most important part of prayer. So Nancy's going to read this for us this morning. It's from Matthew 6, 1 through 18. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the, saint, the, to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. And we'll now sing the prayer, sweet out the hymn, sweet hour of prayer. Pray together. O oh God, speak to us and fill us through the words of my mouth and through the prayers of all of our hearts. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, since it is Camp Sunday and we're all sitting around the table family style, why don't we just start with a little question that you can talk about in your table groups. And if you happen to be in the back, you know, just turn and talk to the people around you. Uh, but here's the question. So Jesus says... Go into your room and close the door and pray by yourself. Now, for all the introverts in the room, they're probably like, hallelujah, yes. <laughs> and the extroverts are like, what, by myself? How can I get anything done by myself? So uh, in your table groups, why don't you answer either um, what is easy for you about being by yourself or what is difficult for you about being by yourself? All right. There you go. So I guess what we're doing is just a little paradoxical this morning, right? Because Jesus says, if you really want to be with God, go by yourself. And we've all come together in groups, and now we're talking about it, right? I think that this is a paradoxical uh, passage. And this is one of those passages that reminds us, boy, it is really important how we read the Bible. How we read the Bible is almost as important as what it says, because if you just lift this passage out of the Bible all by itself, you get a far different message than if you read it in the context of the whole Bible, even the whole Sermon on the Mount. And that came out in our Bible study discussions this week, because we read, um, go into your room and close the door and pray by yourself. And the first question was, but what about that part where he just said, you are the light of the world, and don't put your light under a bushel, right? So these C 
seem to contradict each other, but let's see if we can understand what Jesus is saying here, right? Um, it seems a little paradoxical, but Jesus knows us well, doesn't he? And he knows how tempted we are by many things. One of those things is to find our self-worth in the wrong places. We, we want to be enough, don't we? I mean, we want to, to be at peace and to be enough, but we look for that in places that are not gonna be helpful. And often we look for our self-worth in the valuation of others. We, we determine how good we are by how others see us. And we use all kinds of things to help others see us in a better way, don't we? Um, our birth, even in an egalitarian country like ours, sometimes our, just the family we're born into can give us a, a status. Or our positions, or our possessions, our money, our power, our status. So many things we use to kind of help us look good to other people so that they will be envious or think, boy, that person has it all together. They must really be enough. Jesus knows that we will even use our faith as a commodity, that we can even use our practice of our religion as something to make other people think, boy, that person's got it all together. That person really must be close to God. Boy, that person's so wise. They always have just the right words to say, right? Jesus knows we can even use our faith as a cheap thing to win some easy points and make it look like, boy, we're really close to God, aren't we? And this was in the days before social media. <laughs> I mean, imagine now um, how easy it is to just make yourself look good in front of other people. And you might think, well, you know, Jesus' day was different, but you wouldn't use your religion to make you look cool anymore. Nobody, you know, it's not cool to be religious. Yeah, maybe, but it's cool to be cool religious, right? <laughs> I don't know if you spend a whole lot of time on social media or talking to people who do, but you know how it, uh, online postings work. You can categorize them using a hashtag. And if you tag a, a photo or a post with a hashtag, you can click on that hashtag and see all the posts all around the world that people have associated with that category. Well, blessed is one of those hashtags. So <laughs> if you go on Instagram and you check the hashtag blessed, do you know how many pictures are there? 108 million, oh. right? 108 million, yeah. And if you look at that category, half of them are memes with the word God in them, which are semi-inspirational. Things like, God's got you, you got this. You know, that kind of thing. And the other half of them seem to be people who are really beautiful, wearing bathing suits in tropical places, and you know, they post a picture of themselves on vacation, hashtag blessed. <laughs> this is a very public uh, way to kind of say, Boy, you've got it good. And um, it's even become so popular that I hear people using hashtag blessed as a joke now, as a joke of saying, as a way of saying that something is just too, too good, right? So someone will do something and say, oh, well, you know, hashtag blessed, right? I mean, Jesus knew us. He, he knew us before Instagram. He knows that, that we just have this, there's something in us that wants to put on a show, and we will even use our faith to do it. And so Jesus says, if you really want to know how to pray, just get rid of all that temptation. Just get rid of all of that uh, desire for someone else to think that you are close to God. Because if that's what you want, if you want Instagram likes or hearts, or if you want people to think you're awesome, then you're going to get it, and that's all you will get. You won't be close to God. You'll get all the others thinking you are, but you won't. You'll only get that as your reward. So he says, just shut them all out. Get rid of all that other stuff. All the temptation for people to think you're wise or learned or close to God or an awfully calm person. Just get rid of all that. And you know what's left when you get rid of all that? God. You and God. And that is when the transformative prayer happens. Because when you get rid of all of that, who are you left with? Yourself and everything that you bring. And God and everything that God brings. And it's a really good match. <laughs> Jesus says, here's how you should pray. 
right? Once you shut everybody else out, you don't need a whole awful lot. You really don't. You just say about four things. He says, uh, first, ground yourself in who God is, right? Remember that God is with you and just be centered in God's presence. Hallowed be thy name. Then he says, give God thanks for what you've received. Or, uh, sorry, that's number three. Number two is to uh, uh, remember that God has a will. And it's God's will that we want to live out, not our own. Not the things that we want, the things that God wants. And we can align our will with God's. Not my will, but thy will be done. Then God says, uh, I mean, then Jesus says, give thanks for what God has given you and tell God what you need. You need your daily uh, bread. You need your daily things, the, the physical things that you need to be fully human, and also the spiritual things you need to be fully human. You need bread, but you need forgiveness. You need healing. You need resistance from temptation. We, we need things, and God provides them. Not other people, but God. And then prepare yourself to go back into the world and live in that way. So lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the pattern of prayer. And you can do this all the time and anywhere. You can say those words that Jesus taught us in that Sermon on the Mount, or you can just use that as a pattern to help you remember, oh God, I'm so grateful that you are here. And uh, please help me to remember that you are with me all the time so that I can do what you want, not the things that I want. And give me what I need today. Help my bank account make it to the end of the month. Help me to have enough time for my children. Help me to, to put aside those things that weigh me down or help me to find some healing about this thing that is paining, uh, giving me so much pain. And be with me when I have to leave this place and go out into the world. Help me to be the kind of person you want me to be, right? Just closing everybody else out and being with God will help you to have that relationship with God. Don't Instagram it. <laughs> you Instagram it, you just lose everything, right? Except, except that Jesus says, you're the light of the world. Don't hide yourself. Um, Jesus, how does this work, right? Remember when he says you're the light of the world, it's after the Beatitudes. When he tells the people gathered what kind of people they should be because what kind of people live with God. It's not the rich and the powerful and the ones who get all the decision making, all that. It's the peacemakers. It's those who are humble and meek. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You can be that kind of person. And if you are that kind of person, there will be no hiding it but you can really only be that kind of person if you spend time with God. You can't be that kind of per to person if you're trying to show off for everybody around you. So does it sound paradoxical? You've got to go by yourself so you can be with God so that others will see your light shine. But if you want others to see your light shine, you're gonna miss it entirely. It does sound paradoxical, and it is. And I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, Christianity leads us to some paradoxical places. I had another objection to this passage this week, and I was frustrated uh, with Jesus <laughs> um, for, helping, for having me read this passage when I then had the experience that I had this week. Um, so, you might remember last year, about this time, we re rearranged our sanctuary because we hosted the high school for their challenge day. Um, we did another challenge day with the high school this year. Fortunately, the Nazarene Church hosted it this time, and that was really awesome <laughs> for us not to do that work. But they still invited me to come and participate. And uh, the challenge day is a little bit hard to explain, but they have counselors who come, and they, they lead about 80 students and 20 teachers, so 100 people, in um, a one-day retreat or workshop and it's about how to, um, they use this metaphor of the iceberg. You know, when an iceberg is floating along, you only see the top 10% of it. And underneath the surface is the, the rest of it, which is most of it. 
And they say, we are like icebergs, right? We care an awful lot about the 10% that everyone sees. But under the surface, when we're by ourselves, is who we really are. And so they say, um, you've got to drop the water line a little bit and let people see who you really are. Because you've got to own up to that. Because you're carrying it with you all the time. And if you're pretending it's not there, pretending you don't feel the things that you feel, or you're not wrestling with the things that you're carrying around, that's not going to lead to anything good. Um, and if you drop your waterline and you can see that others are dropping their waterline too, it builds empathy. That suddenly I can see the things you're carrying around with you all the time, and guess what? I'm not alone. So they do a lot of these exercises to help kids kind of feel their feelings, see what they're carrying with them, and see what others are carrying with them so they can see they're not alone. Um, we have small groups and a couple different exercises, and then in the afternoon, um, they do a really powerful exercise called cross the line. So they've got two lines just laid down on the, on the floor, and they put everybody in the room on one side of the line. And then uh, the leader stands kind of off to the side and reads a category. And if that category applies to you, you're invited to cross the line to the other side. And then there's two sides looking at each other across a divide, and there's a difference there. And you can suddenly see how people have been affected in life. And this goes on for 45 minutes. There are a lot of categories. And the categories are heavy. Things like, um, um, has, has, you, has any family member ever been in jail? Right? Have you ever spent time in the foster care system? Have you or anyone you've known struggled with suicide? Um, have you ever been judged by the color of your skin or the shape of your body? Um, have you ever been pressured sexually to do something you didn't want to do? I mean, friends, these things, one after the other, are really hard to just listen to. But then to see the number of kids who cross the line. Have you uh, ever lost anyone you've loved to gun violence? In Ridgefield, I would guess 25 kids cross the line. Suicide, half the room crossed the line. Um, our kids are dealing with heavy stuff. Because why? We are dealing with heavy stuff, right? Kids um, whose parents are, are in pain, and they're carrying that pain for them, and then the pain of not knowing who they can talk to about it. And I left with just love in my heart for the kids that I met, and I, I told my little group, I just want to hug you like all day and come to school and hug you and, you know, and protect you and let you know you're not alone. And all the kids, after we did that cross-the-line experiment, would say, well, I didn't know that that person was dealing with that. I didn't know that I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. you know, when they're over there on the other side, they see, boy, this is something heavy I've been carrying with me, but there's a person right next to me who knows exactly what I'm going through, right? And I thought about Jesus' words that said, go into your room by yourself and close the door. And I wanted to say, don't read this part of the Bible, okay? <laughs> Come to our church and, and we'll love you and you won't be alone anymore. So what do we do with this? Because, you know, Jesus has a pretty good track record of not being wrong with me. <laughs> uh, usually I'm the one who's wrong. Jesus is right. And you know, there just are some times in life where you've got to be the one to go through it. No one else can do it for you. You've got to, to ground yourself in God's spirit and grace and find a way forward. And that was true for all these kids. I couldn't do it for them. They're going to have to find a, a place where it's just them and God and they make some decisions to get them through. But boy, when you're by yourself, don't you need to know that there are people waiting for you on the other side of that door who will love you and receive you? I mean, think about the times when you've had to walk that difficult road, either a road of grief or a life change or transition or a big decision you had to make, and you were the only one who could do it. But how helpful was it to have a constant stream of cards in your mailbox from your church letting you know you weren't alone, right? How helpful was it to, to come through the doors and get a hug and say, how are you doing this week? I've been thinking about you. Right? When we go into that place by ourselves with God, we got to have people waiting for us, to receive us, to encourage us, to sometimes say, I think you need to go be by yourself for a minute. 
Um, so we gotta read these words carefully. And we gotta know that there are people out there who need us. You know, we've been trying this tutoring thing on Sunday nights. I told the United Methodist Women's Group, uh, let me just be honest. The tutoring thing for me, I don't care about that much. All right? If kids need homework help, I don't really care about that. What I care about are the connections and the relationships and these teenagers who are becoming adults and they are trying to take on the whole pain of the world and there's no one there to help them with it. And that's what I want. Um, you know, kind of like when you eat a bagel, the bagel's just an excuse for the cream cheese on top. <laughs> but you gotta have the bagel, you can't just eat cream cheese out of the jar. Uh, to me, uh, the connection is the cream cheese, the tutoring part is the bagel. I'm okay to give up the tutoring part. I just want these kids to know that we love them because God loves them. And sometimes the pain is too much to carry by themselves. They've gotta go through it. We can't do it for them. But I want them to know they're not alone because someone told me I wasn't alone, right? A lot of those people I met at camp, by the way. So um, Jesus tells us how to pray. And we come together and we get the support and we know that sometimes we just gotta go and pray and have that grounding time with Jesus. And we've had that in our lives. And then we get to become the light, the light on the hill, the light of the world shining for everybody. So where are we gonna shine? How are we gonna invite people uh, into this relationship that heals? into a relationship where they can have this healing time with God, but not totally by themselves, so they can come and know that they are loved also. Why don't we, around our tables as we finish up, why don't we answer one more set of questions. You can either answer um, how you are gonna find some time with God this week by yourself, or who you're gonna reach out to this week because they've had too much time by themselves. All right? So that's the question around our table. How are you going to find some time by yourself this week because you need it? Or how are you going to reach out to a person who's had too much time by themselves? You don't have to share names uh, to keep it confidential, but uh, someone that you've, you've noticed needs some time uh, with a loving community. So why don't we just take a few minutes to answer those questions. <laughs>